Sure. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar on uh, live plants and emergency planning. Um, I'm going to quickly go through a few slides here. Um, the best way to keep in touch with what we are doing at um, Connecting to Collections Care is to join the CTCC announce list. This is the email address so that you can, uh, or the web address so that you can join it. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Um, and also, everything is announced on our website. Um, and if you have questions about caring for your collections, you can join the Connecting to Collections Care community. And the instructions for doing that are uh, at this website, on, on our website, under, excuse me, under discussions. And um, if you were an old member of Connecting to Collections or Connecting to Collections Care, our discussions have changed, have moved to a new platform. And we can't just move everyone, so you need to join there. Um, and if you have questions, you can always contact me. This is my email address. And this month, we have the beginning of another course, Planning Your Reorg Project, which we're doing with uh, CCI in Canada and UNESCO. Reorg is a fabulous uh, uh, storage planning uh, program. This is the first time anything like this has been offered in the US. So uh, it's a real opportunity. And then our next uh, free webinar is going to be Exploring Old Loans. And that will be on April 16th. And that should be posted pretty quickly. It's not up quite yet. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Jackie Salas. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming in, uh, tuning in today to discuss planning for uh, natural disasters in uh, with botanical collections. So I know this is a, a little atypical for the group. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Foundation for Advancement and Conservation and Connecting to Collections Care for uh, thinking about botanical collections and inviting me to speak. Uh, so welcome, everybody, from around the country, it looks like. Uh, I am in sunny Oakland, California. Uh, I grew up in the East Bay here in California, near San Francisco, and uh, I am definitely in earthquake territory. So that's uh, lifelong drills for earthquakes uh, are something that I have uh, in my DNA at this point. And so uh, when I was going through my education, I uh, was interested in plants. I got my undergraduate degree uh, from UC Davis uh, in environmental horticulture and urban forestry. Uh, I learned about plants. And when I was working in conservatories and Arboreta uh, doing internships, uh, I was asking collections and uh, managers and curators about emergency plans, since it's something that I you know, had grown up being involved with. And it uh, turned out that there actually wasn't too much information anecdotally that I could get from these curators about what important plants uh, were in their collections, how they were actually being protected from things like uh, floods and potential fires uh, that may have occurred in the past and could potentially occur in the future. So it was just something that I've been interested in in, uh, in my uh, studies. I end up uh, getting accepted to the Longwood Graduate Program, where I decided to uh, study disaster planning for my thesis. Uh, I, I, and I see Chad just joined. Hi, Chad. We, I actually spoke with him during my thesis uh, uh, studies. So um, this uh, research that I'm going to share with you today about planning for botanical collections, uh, potential uh, mitigation strategies for disaster damage, uh, all of this information was obtained uh, through my disaster planning studies. Uh, through the University of Delaware in the Longwood Graduate Program. Uh, after I graduated in 2009, I got a job at Children's Fairyland in downtown Oakland. 
And uh, I had worked in a, a private estate and uh, with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy a little bit before that. Um, and I landed at Children's Fairyland, which is a, a perfect melding of working with plants and people. Uh, so it's something I do. I get to uh, uh, share share my uh, joy for plants and people and children's fairyland. Uh, I did continue uh, to be interested in uh, risk assessment and uh, uh, planning for potential uh, disasters in terms of uh, tree risk assessment. So our biggest uh, plant collection that's most valuable at Children's Fairyland is our oak trees. We have about 45 coast live oak trees that we manage, and those trees are um, the backbone of our landscape. And so that got me interested in learning more about how to care for them, and so I obtained my uh, arborist license through the International Society of Arboriculture, and I got my uh, risk assessment through the same organization as well so that I could learn how to best manage um, my uh, canopy. Here we go. Uh, again, a, a little slide to say that I'm currently employed at Children's Fairyland in downtown Oakland, where my main areas of focus are grounds maintenance, habitat stewardship, and kids education to get those kids interested, our next round of curators and plant collectors out there. Uh, and in order to uh, keep that environment happy, uh, I do have to manage the landscape and deal with some disasters. Uh, these uh, are mostly biological and man-made disasters at Children's Fairyland. So uh, the man-made, you can see ruts from a food truck that uh, accidentally thought that he could make it from uh, one gate to another and slipped down our pasture and made ruts all through our lawn. So there's uh, human error involved with that that uh, can be avoided. Uh, but uh, biological uh, uh, issues that come up are our actual natural disasters that I deal with most, uh, most at Children's Fairyland. We have a Phytophthora, we have root rot in our soils that are common and uh, you combine uh, traffic of 200,000 visitors walking across uh, uh, root systems and uh, compaction of the soil, uh, heavy clays that don't allow for much aeration, and we get some biological issues going on. So I have had to deal a little bit with uh, some disasters at Fairyland, but knock on wood, I have not had to deal with anything intense. Uh, so, move on to the next slide. Uh, why are we here today? Why are we talking about disaster planning and uh, botanical collections? Well, when you go to a garden, you go to a garden for the plants. If the plants aren't there, what's the point? So we really need to make sure in a botanical setting that our plant collections are maintained and uh, 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 preserved in situations where there could be potential damage. So in this picture, you'll see Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. There is a picture of Hurricane Andrew damage on the left. The area is supposed to look like the picture on the right. So this picture on the right is taken from the top of the, uh, the bridge where, that you see in the background of the picture on the left. So you can see the incredible amount of damage that can happen to a botanical institution. Uh, during a natural disaster. Again, this is a hurricane. This is Longview House and Garden uh, down in New Orleans. Uh, this is damage that the garden uh, uh, obtained after Hurricane Katrina. So on the right, you can see damage that happened to the uh, canopy of trees. You shouldn't be able to see that much sky through the canopy. The canopy should be nice and dense. And unfortunately, the hurricane came through and had ripped off a uh, majority of the leaves in that canopy, which opens up the gardens underneath to much more sun than they're used to and does damage the trees. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see damage to flooding from flooding. Uh, so uh, soil is picked up during floods and moved into different locations in the garden where there's not usually soil. Uh, so you can see heavy mounding of soil in atypical places. 
and uh, debris that's moved in with the soil. So uh, you can see some examples of damage here. Uh, so disaster planning is important to botanical institutions uh, because they are uh, a way to keep your institution going after uh, it incurs a problem. So we need to safeguard our institutions and uh, keep them going for the community. So uh, I'll discuss a little bit later in some case studies. I worked with Brookside Gardens in, outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, even if you don't have any specific plants that are in your collection that are uh, extremely valuable, so I know I'm talking to a, a community that may not have botanical collections in the forefront of their collections. We may be talking to historic sites with uh, uh, one or two valuable trees or plant specimens that belong to the owner originally. We may be talking to small museums here in this audience that could have some herbarium specimens that may be important, but no actual living collections. Uh, so I do want to talk in general about disaster planning for everyone, uh, but specifically uh, for botanical collections, it's very important to us uh, to safeguard our collections, again, because without the plants, nobody's going to come to the garden. Uh, so uh, they, disaster planning is also a component of accreditation. So in American Association of uh, Museums and the American Public Gardens Association, in order to actually be accredited, uh, it's been over 10 years that the American Association of Museums has required uh, disaster preparedness. But I can say just recently that uh, the American Public Gardens Association, just this year in 2019, has included uh, disaster preparedness planning as a requirement to become accredited with their network. So uh, you may you may and want to do a disaster plan to keep your garden uh, or plant collection safe, but you may also have to do a plan in order for accreditation. So either way, if you want to or if you have to, um, this talk will be able to give you some insight, be able to put a simple plan together that will help to safeguard your collection. So you're going to see this slide a few times. Uh, this is just to keep us, but mainly me, on track. So this is going to be the topics that will be covered during this discussion today. Uh, does anybody have any quick questions that they want to post in the general chat before we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the talk? Uh, feel free and go ahead and, and uh, list any initial questions in the side. And then uh, there will be some opportunity for questions at the end also. So I'd like to keep uh, specific questions uh, for the end. Uh, there was also going to be four quizzes presented throughout the uh, discussion. And uh, the quizzes will be topical to what we're talking about during the discussion. We'll go over those answers as they are uh, relayed from the participants. Um, and so we'll just go right ahead. Uh, finding general resources for disaster planning is the first item that we will discuss. And it's uh, easy. It is uh, a basic slide that is going to talk about different websites you can go to, different organizations and different websites that you can go to that have general planning resources available. So these are not botanically specific. These are cultural. Uh, institutions, uh, it, these are organizations that help cultural institutions with uh, general planning. So you will find links to all of these uh, websites in the handouts below. If you have not had a chance to download the handouts, uh, now would be a great time for everybody to download those handouts and uh, look at the information contained. Uh, so not only will you find the websites with links uh, for the general and botanical uh, planning resources that are available that I'll be discussing. But you'll also find a natural disaster planning template. So we're actually going to go over that natural disaster planning template that I created during my thesis research. And as, if this, that would be a, a wonderful template to be able to write uh, notes directly onto uh, while I'm doing this discussion. Um, so feel free, again, to download those handouts and print them out for your talk. 
Um, so the, obviously you're here, so you know about the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation. There's some great information that you can find on their website. The Heritage Emergency National Task Force is a network of cultural institutions that work together to provide emergency planning and support for one another. Again, the American Association of Museums requires uh, disaster planning um, uh, documents for accreditation within their organization, so you can find information and assistance through them. The Getty Institute has some valuable worksheets that you can uh, work through. Uh, dplan.org is an interesting uh, website that you can go to that actually you can input information into the website and it will uh, print you out a mock-up uh, plan right then and there. Uh, so um, depending on your collection, you may be able to use that as uh, a nice resource for a simple plan for yourself. And the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training is a federal uh, government resource that has some information on how to uh, deal with cultural institutional uh, planning or disaster uh, mitigation. Uh, so we're going to dive right into the surveys, case studies, and interviews that I made during my thesis research. So this is the, um, the real meat and potatoes of the talk, where we are going to discuss uh, botanical information that I uh, obtained through my, uh, my studies. Um, we're going to start off with uh, some surveys in a second. Um, this is just an example of all the research that I did. It's basically my qualifications, so you know that I spent two years of my life delving into this topic, and I, uh, I have the authority to be discussing it with you here today. So uh, we don't need to dwell on that. You can go back and look if you're interested in exactly what I did for the thesis topic. And um, I act, you can actually download the website. I'll show you where to download the actual um, the actual thesis later on. So here is the first quiz that I was talking about. Uh, this is a question about how many institutions are here. We want to see how many are here and how many actually have a disaster plan. So this will help guide the talk. Uh, so let's see. So tuning in, it looks like this is great many of you have a general emergency or disaster plan at your organization. And for those of you that don't, this is exactly why you're here. So we will uh, help you to get the resources you need to, to get one later on. Um, so let me see here if I try to move the slide forward if the quiz stays. Yes, it does. So this is a slide that I took in uh, 2008. The survey shows that uh, Fifty percent of uh, public gardens that were surveyed actually had a natural disaster plan in place. So you can see here that uh, I asked uh, the American Public Gardens Association members uh, to participate in a survey about natural disaster damage. And during that survey, this was one of the questions that was asked, uh, they responded saying that, 50% uh, did have a natural disaster plan, and 49% did not. So uh, let's see what this uh, group that's here today actually says in terms. Can we have the results of the quiz back up on the screen? Uh, let's see. So we are way ahead of the game in terms of uh, disaster planning. Uh, compared to the Public Gardens Association. Sorry, Public Gardens Association. Uh, it, way back in 2000, and uh, the survey was taken in 2007 for publishing in 2008. Uh, so that's incredibly wonderful news to know that this group that we're talking to does actually have a plan, so we're already ahead of the game. Uh, the 15%, again, you're here for a reason, and we'll get you set up with the resources you need to create a plan. 
Uh, so on to the next question. We have our second uh, uh, quiz question that we would like to know. Of the organizations that do have a disaster plan, uh, how many uh, actually have uh, your collections represented in terms of mitigation in that plan. So are your collections protected uh, through the plan, or is it just a general uh, plan? Mike, is it possible to see the actual uh, number of, is it just the nine and the, the six that are answering the 16? And there's the no vote. Uh, Five percent. So you can see here that when it comes to actually preparing for your collections, there is a higher number of organizations that do not take into uh, heart the collections in their plan. And so that's uh, again, why we're here, and that's what we're going to be discussing in this talk. So uh, you can see emergency planning, there was 88%, I believe, was the answer to the first question. There was 88% of us that had uh, general planning information, but when it comes down to our actual collections, here we see, great, we have 84.6, I'm going to write that down for later, and 15.3%, uh, no, so 22 and 4 uh, to the first question. And we have um, basically 60 and 49. So we have 13 and 9 for a second. So um, that is why we're here. Long story short, mitigation uh, is, in terms of collections is actually a little bit harder to do than the uh, basic planning for putting together uh, uh, emergency plans and contact lists for humans. Um, so let's get back into the talk now that we uh, know our group and who we're talking to. Uh, we are going to help with getting information for folks uh, that need planning information. And sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Uh, this was in line with um, our, the survey that I took in my thesis uh, research. So uh, when asked, the, that same group that had originally said that there was basically half and half that had had uh, disaster plans, um, when I asked the people that had disaster plans, so there was 51% 50 per, of the organizations had had disaster plans in 2007 when the survey was taken. Um, of that 50%, there was only 18% that had plant protection or salvage, uh, salvage information in the um, in their actual plan. Uh, that in 2004, uh, Heritage Heritage Health Index reported that 20% of mu museum collections had been protected, uh, and so. Uh, it was actually in line. The public garden uh, numbers were in line with uh, the Heritage Health Index report of 20%. It was about the same, uh, saying that um, there was actually 80% of collections that were not uh, protected through disaster plans. So we are actually doing better. This group here today uh, is actually doing better. We said that um, there's about 60 percent, uh, 55, 60 percent that do have plans. So that is wonderful to me to hear. We're doing better. So it'd be interesting to take a new survey 10 years later. We already discussed that. Um, so we're doing better. We're, uh, it looks like, at least through this group, that more people are planning. Um, so enough to talk about that. Let's get into the FEMA document that will actually uh, give us four phases to work on for planning. Uh, I chose to use the uh, FEMA document 3866, which is integrating historical property and cultural resource considerations into hazard mitigation planning for a starting point for a general disaster plan that would um, be able to be uh, 
specifically worked on for plant collection. And I chose this because it was simple. So there are four, uh, four levels of planning that are involved with this document that are organizing your resources, assessing the potential hazards to your collection, what damage could actually occur from floods or fires or earthquakes, uh, looking at those risks and actually developing a plan, some actual uh, mitigation strategies that could provide uh, protection or salvage uh, for issues that happen uh, as a result of uh, those risks coming reality. And then, uh, and then implementing and monitoring, uh, monitoring the plan. So uh, here is an like a basic outline that I started with. So again, organizing resources. Uh, I'm going to try to use my arrow here. Let's see if it works. Mike, can you see the arrow? Is the arrow working here? I'm trying to draw. Uh, OK, so organizing resources, assessing risks, developing a mitigation plan, and implementing the plan and monitoring its process. You can see for all of the information that it's going to take to create, here's the arrow that I'm thinking of. Um, it actually uh, is condensed into a one-page document. So this is important. Uh, we uh, need to keep it simple in order to make sure that it's done. So all of us at nonprofits uh, wear many hats. And so we don't want to get into a process that's going to take an extreme amount of time that none of us have. So looking at this as a one-page document and thinking through in simple terms is going to allow for an efficient, effective, uh, plan to be developed if by any means you have the time to delve into the subject in further detail you could spend a career developing uh, uh, large planning processes and teams and local networks to help uh, with salvage and mitigation but uh, for most people's purposes especially the small collection groups that are going to be uh, here for this talk uh, uh, keeping it simple is very helpful. Uh, so in line with that, um, this is the next poll. Uh, how much time will your organization have to spend putting a plan together? Uh, will your organization have uh, one work day, one to three work days, or more than three work days that you can allow on actually putting a plan together? Um, and then I can know how much detail I should get into later in the talk. Uh, so that would be helpful if you could keep answering that question. And I'm going to jump ahead to the next slide while we keep answering this, this question. You can see my little arrow stuck here. So I'm going to put the arrow away now. Uh, so in wanting to adapt this FEMA document, this original FEMA document was uh, for uh, mitigating hazards in cultural institutions. So I wanted to take that document and see how it would work in botanical collections. So I chose three different gardens, a natural type garden, a display garden with lots of ornamental plants, and a historic landscape that is more about keeping in line with the look of an old historic estate. And I used information from those case studies to adapt the plan. So here I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the actual plan uh, in terms of case studies. The first is Adkins Arboretum. Uh, Adkins Arboretum is in Maryland, and it is a natural garden. So it actually uh, uh, interprets and does educational programming on the native plants in uh, Maryland. So during a case study, I asked them questions about their collections and what they thought was most important. They, uh, they were less concerned about specific plants 
and damage to individual uh, germplasm than they were about being able to take that information and interpret it to their general public and the, the population that would come back to the gardens after a disaster. They wanted to be able to teach based on the damage and let the public know uh, what happened in an environmental setting after a disaster as a component of the damage. Uh, there were a few threatened species that they were interested in uh, uh, mitigating and salvaging. And those species, uh, they were interested in developing plans to share uh, uh, propagations off-site and to uh, potentially, uh, you know, you could dig something up and transplant it to an area that was safer. Um, so they were interested in some specific salvage uh, tactics, but they were more interested in a natural setting in discussing the damage that was going to occur to the garden with their public as an as a educational opportunity. Brookside Garden is a garden that is a, in a municipal setting outside of Washington, D.C. It is a display garden, and it is heavily focused on ornamental plants and uh, fun educational programming to get the general public into a garden setting. So it has a very different mission than the Adkins Arboretum. Uh, in talking with uh, representatives from Brookside Garden, uh, it was uh, found that the highest priority in terms of salvage and uh, was actually going to be a cleanup getting everything back together in working order that would be safe enough to have the community be able to come back in and sourcing uh, display plants, annuals, and perennials that would look good, that would be able to be plunked back into the garden so that Brookside could be a safe haven for people that had experienced the natural disaster to be able to come back to their garden and enjoy the space as a refuge, a place for respite after they had been dealing with the damage. So very different results uh, than from the natural garden that had wanted to educate the public on the disaster and how plants recovered. Brookside wanted to use itself as a place for uh, the community to be able to come back and actually just be able to relax and try to in, uh, enjoy the moment while they were surrounded by personal uh, struggle in dealing with the disaster that they had experienced. So very interesting that these two places had had entirely different results on what the focus of their uh, salvage and recovery efforts were going to be. Uh, so the third case study was Longview House and Gardens. And Longview House and Gardens is down in New Orleans. You saw originally in one of the first slides that I had showed of garden damage that they had experienced uh, Hurricane Katrina damage. And during that Hurricane Katrina damage, um, they had experienced uh, a large hit to their collections because you can see, I'm going to use the pointer here again. Uh, or I'm not going to use the pointer, uh, but the picture to the right is a canal. You can see the chain link in the middle picture is, uh, there we go, thank you, Mike. Uh, the picture in the middle is the, uh, the canal from the garden walkway that you can see in the left-hand picture. So if you're on that walkway, you look out through that chain link fence off to your right, and you see that giant canal. So if there was ever a vulnerable garden, it would be Longview House and Gardens, in that that canal, if it spills over, the garden is underwater. And so they had experienced significant flooding during Hurricane Katrina, and um, they were able to pull their garden back together after the disaster using historical design. So they had uh, archived their designs uh, that were created for the historic estate. And as a component of their disaster planning and salvage, they uh, had plant lists 
based off their historical designs that they could pull their plant list from uh, garden uh, nurseries outside of the area to replant with their uh, historical plants as soon as possible. So having their restoration plan in place before the disasters helps to get uh, salvage done quicker after the damage because they could refer to their plan and not have to start from scratch. So in their garden, they actually wanted to focus on those coast, uh, they're not coast live oaks, they're um, southern oaks down there, southern live oaks. Uh, sorry, there's my Oakland coast live oak hat going on. Uh, but they wanted their uh, focus in disaster damage to be on tree mitigation because in their landscape, without those trees, uh, the gardens below suffered. So any old camellias that needed shade, or uh, other types of collections that had depended on the canopy of those trees, if those trees were gone, then the collections below would uh, suffer. So in their garden, they wanted to, uh, to focus on any mitigation strategies they could use to get those trees healthier so that they could recover from the damage faster and shade the gardens below quicker after the uh, issue had happened. And um, so very interesting results that in a historic site, uh, you're focusing on uh, the canopy cover, and you're focusing on the uh, historical designs and plans that had been in place for a long time to use as your uh, uh, mitigation uh, strategy. Um, so we looked at uh, three different gardens for the case studies, and they had three pretty different results. So their results depended on their mission. So the natural garden wanted to educate. The display garden wanted to replace and be a place for uh, uh, solace and uh, respite. Uh, the historic site wanted to uh, make their collection, uh, uh, keep their collection um, uh, safe by uh, creating the canopy cover and converting the damaged gardens back to the historic landscape as soon as possible. So this is very interesting information that we were able to get from the case studies. Um, move on to the slide. Uh, we talked before this case study uh, discussion about the amount of time switching hats again, back to how much time your organization would have to put a uh, plan together. So can we have that slide back up that had the results of the question number three? Uh, let's see how much actual time that you're going to have to put your plan together. So I can see here, is there the uh, three plus, I'm not getting the three uh, plus work days information in the, my little text box that shows the answers. Is there, here we go. Uh, this is great news. So many of you are going to be able to have more than three working days to put your plan together. That's ideal. So that's really wonderful. So we can talk in a little bit more detail. For those of you that don't have the luxury of having more than three work days to put your plan together, uh, you just won't be able to get as detailed, but you'll be able to focus on specific information that is most the highest priority. So you can focus on highest priority, and as time allows, you can add to that basic document that you can create with more information. Um, so thank you, Mike, for that slide. Uh, let's look at the last question here that we have, uh, which is of the institutions that do uh, want to create a disaster planning strategy, are uh, there specific uh, plants in your collection uh, that you're interested in safeguarding? Um, so I know we're a general museum-based organization that I'm discussing uh, this topic with here today, and I was interested in knowing if even though you're a museum-based organization, if there are specific living collection or specific plants that you would like to have information about. Um, so yes, so that's why you're here. 
uh, great. So we have uh, quite a few of you that do have specific living collections. OK. Verifying that we are here for the right reason. OK. So thank you, Mike. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, we are going to go into detail now about um, some interviews that were conducted during thesis research. And these interviews, uh, again, were uh, in order to adapt uh, the FEMA document into a, a document that would help with botanical collections and not just general. So we talked to nine interview sites about specific damage that they had incurred during uh, damage to uh, specifically hurricanes and flooding were the two main disasters that uh, most had incurred damage from. And I'm excited to see that some of the organizations that uh, I visited are here during the talk today. Uh, so you'll be able to chat on the side if I say something that doesn't add up and <laughs> jump right in in the chat and set me straight. Uh, so the first interview site that I went to was the Louisiana State University's uh, Horticultural Research Center, which is called the Burden Center. And if you have a collection that is uh, research focused, uh, you have some specific plants that you are growing in your collections that nobody else on Earth has. So I'm assuming that in a research setting, you are developing new cultivars, you are sowing seeds from plants that have been collected on uh, expeditions where nobody has gone before to collect seeds. You have important, important uh, germplasm in your collection. So in order to identify which plants are which, it's very important to either write on the pots, the sides of the actual nursery pots, what plant is contained in that pot. It's important to take your labels and actually stick your labels way down in the dirt and have another one in the top. So if something comes through and knocks all the uh, tags out of the, the pots that are at surface level, that you actually have some uh, documentation of what that specimen is. Uh, some uh, places, this uh, burden center actually had gone through and identified locations of specific plants with a mapping system before a disaster occurred so that they could go back and uh, identify which, where, where things had started. So, you know, things are going to end up in different places, but at least you know where they had started. Um, so that is some very specific information that uh, the Burden Center shared. Very helpful. Uh, New Orleans Botanical Garden has been hit very hard quite a few times. And I was able to talk with them about uh, their Katrina damage. Um, so this is very interesting that after Katrina, uh, they were actually able to get some power up through generators and um, the city to light their organization up for a holiday event. So the rest of the city was dark, and uh, they were bright. And the, the community, like in Brookside Gardens, wanting to be a, a place for, uh, for um, some uh, refuge, they were able to uh, create a public environment that was very uh, happy for a community that had been hit hard. So that was uh, something that ended up creating a uh, surplus in money for them to be able to help them recover. So it's not only a wonderful thing for the community, but it actually helped their bottom line and allowed them to get back up quicker than they would have been otherwise, would, would have been able to otherwise. So um, I thought that was a very interesting thing that they had shared. Uh, they tested their soil after the, the flooding that had happened. It's very important if you have uh, valuable specimens in the soil and not in containers to test your soil and see what's uh, been released during the flooding. You will definitely have to do some sort of soil mitigation after a flooding. And you'll want to see how bad and how, and how, how deep you'll have to delve into that soil mitigation. So hopefully a, a long leach would be able to get most of the salts out. But if there's any hazardous materials, oils, and uh, toxins that have been released into the soil, you don't want them to affect your visceral uh, 
plant collections. Very important to test your soils after a flooding type event. Uh, and an interesting thing that they had chosen to do was to plant and replant uh, riparian uh, species in their canopy cover because they can withstand uh, flooding. So riparian trees are typically the types of trees that grow along corridors of rivers and creeks and streams. So they're used to having their feet wet, which means their roots can be underwater uh, for, for uh, periods of time without them dying. And so that is also an interesting thing to think about in terms of uh, uh, managing your, your canopy so that the rest of your garden, like at Longview, doesn't uh, get burnt after a disaster. And uh, you can plant some species that are adapted to the natural disasters on site, as long as your design allows. If you're in a historic site, then you're stuck to whatever the historical designs uh, specify. But if you have the choice, you may look at what disasters are in the area that are typical for uh, your garden and uh, say in California, plant a, a fire adapted species that may be a chaparral and regrow from the, the roots or uh, burnt bark faster uh, than a, a species that is not fire adapted. So next I discussed uh, disaster damage and planning uh, uh, for mitigation with the City of New Orleans, the uh, Department of Landscape Architecture. Uh, they discuss uh, in FEMA contracts to not only include uh, cleanup and recovery, but also maintenance for a year. If it's a possibility to include maintenance in your contract, that would help because uh, your staff is going to be occupied with uh, putting the facility and the programming back together. If you can have uh, maintenance crews come in and help to do some of that soil mitigation, help to do some of the canopy regeneration, uh, fertilization efforts, and uh, general cleanup, then it will free up your staff to be able to focus on some of the uh, organizational and programmatic uh, uh, recovery that may be necessary. Uh, and they also uh, pointed out that it was more successful for them when they had replanted uh, specific areas, gardens, parks, instead of trying to spread themselves too thin and do recovery across the whole city all at once, uh, they were able to be uh, more successful in focusing on specific areas because then they could give it all of their attention and then move on to the next. Uh, at Montgomery Botanical Center, uh, two important points that were uh, discussed during interviews was that if you have a collection of plants that is very important, you need to have the people that know which, the, which plants are important do the original assessment. So if you have uh, somebody that's not qualified to do the original assessment, there may be plants that are missed that could be salvaged. There may be plants that um, are high priority that are not valued at high priority that are missed. So the person, the horticulturists and the curators that know the collection should be the ones initially to assess and triage before general cleanup begins. And that seems like it would be kind of obvious, but after a disaster, Everyone is scattered and people are trying to help. You have volunteers showing up that want to do something, but before they get their chainsaws out, you need to have the curators assess the damage that's happened. Um, uh, and we also discussed edge effect. So uh, during a hurricane or strong wind, uh, potentially even some minor flooding events, the edge effect, think of a mangrove, uh, uh, area in a uh, uh, marshy setting. The mangroves uh, act to um, be a, a barrier between the ocean and the island. So if you have a garden where you have an arboretum where there's a large set of plants and surrounded by maybe say fields or uh, meadows, the edge of your collection is going to be more vulnerable than the center of your collection. So in certain cases, leaving felled trees from prior disasters both gives the trees a chance to regenerate, come back, 
um, so you can propagate them for future specimens. But it also creates a wind block for future damage that could potentially happen. Uh, here's where I saw Chad on the general chat. Hi, Chad. Uh, we discussed um, damage at Naples Botanical Garden. Uh, so this was very interesting chat in that um, they uh, pointed out that local resources could potentially provide very important resources that you could use for uh, mitigation and salvage practices. So it's very important to look into your local universities, your local extension agents, and even the municipal setting, the, the city government um, or the counties, to see if there are preparation and mitigation materials that are produced uh, for site-specific, uh, um, not site-specific, but uh, uh, regionally specific information about disasters. Um, and uh, if you have, second point here, if you have pre-charged your handheld GIS unit, um, it will work off that battery after a disaster when there's all the power is out to everything else. You can actually assess your damage with a nice handheld pre-charged unit if you have thought about that and have it ready. Um, again, things move in disasters. So if you have a starting point, and you have an endpoint. You might have some idea of what had happened during the occurrence um, that might be able to help guide your salvage. So if a tree was thrown from point A to point B, uh, palm trees, uh, I didn't know before I had done all this research uh, for my thesis, a palm tree, if its roots are intact, a palm tree can actually be taken from the place that it uh, was thrown and plunked back in its original spot and if you do some serious uh, root, uh, uh, if you do some serious uh, work to uh, amend the soils and fertilize appropriately and shade the tree, give it all the uh, uh, opportunities it needs to have success, it can actually regrow. So um, it's uh, very interesting uh, in terms of salvage uh, to know what's happened to your collection. But point being. Uh, GIS, I see in the questions, is a geographical information system. So it's a, a, a locational, uh, it's like GPS, uh, but uh, in a handheld unit, a ge geographical information system that you can use to pinpoint a location on a plank. Um, so if you have, uh, uh, like I said, if you knew where the plant was to begin with using your old GIS data, your location mapping data, then you can see where the plant either moved after the disaster or you'll know where to replant um, based on where it, it originally was. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Uh, so Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden uh, obviously is in uh, uh, hurricane territory because it is in southern Florida for people that don't know. Uh, so they said that it, they had actually uh, gotten some uh, FEMA money to recollect seeds for damaged collections. Now this was 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know that that is currently uh, true for today. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, damage unfortunately in the last 10 years and there's uh, thin resources. So that possibility may not be true, but it's something to look into. So if you have expeditions to uh, countries uh, that have specific uh, plant material important to your collection, you may be able to, um, if not from FEMA, from um, some other organizations uh, uh, grant-wise to go back and get your uh, germplasm recollected to begin your collection again. Uh, and again here, this is another research um, uh, tip to write the accession number for the plant that is in the pot on the side of the pot because you never know if after a disaster the plant will be in the same pot that it was originally in. Um, so if you can attach uh, some kind of aluminum tag to the actual plant, that would be important also. 
um, but if not, then writing the accession number on the pot. And sometimes it's actually in organizations, they'll, they'll put plants on their side before the disaster because the disaster is going to come through with high winds and knock plants down in many cases anyway. So there's less damage if you're doing it beforehand. Um, that's another tip. Sometimes I've seen people do that. Uh, Gifford Arboretum was another interview site that I went to. Um, they discussed uh, planting small specimens that could root into the soil themselves. So if you have a large container and you plunk it in the ground, it's already developed a root system, and it is not going to develop little teeny tiny cedar roots that turn into giant, large scaffolding roots. Um, it is going to have those preset roots that it had in the pot and then develop a network of smaller roots outside of that 24-inch box. So if you have a one-gallon pot and you put that into the ground, it's developing those scaffolding roots from the start. And so those scaffolding roots are going to get into that native soil and dig its little roots in deep. So it's very important to plant small specimens when possible so that your root system can be as natural as possible. Um, and uh, more logistically, a uh, second point refers to appropriate um, oversight in terms of cleanup procedures. Again, you want to make sure that people uh, that know the collection are watching the cleanup to make sure that uh, items that are uh, being chainsawed are lesser priority than uh, items that would need hand sawing or uh, more careful uh, mitigation strategies. Sometimes a cleanup crew would come across a path and see a tree in a path and they just cut it up into pieces. Well, if you have the right people uh, monitoring the cleanup process, they can say, well, is there a different way of doing that in just putting the tree back upright instead of chainsawing right through it. So that's a, a general uh, logistical um, tip. So again, we talked about uh, soil layers at the Kampong, uh, which is uh, another tropical, it's a national tropical botanical garden in southern Florida. It's their site there. They also have a site uh, in Hawaii. Uh, the Kampong uh, is a Southern Florida site that um, had had extensive hurricane damage in the past. And they again talked about soil layers being very important uh, to creating a healthy tree and root system. And if uh, root systems had been damaged in the past, they had had success with canopy sprinklers to uh, water the tops of the trees when the bottoms of the trees weren't taking up any water. So some tropical specimens can uh, uh, be uh, assisted through uh, topical overhead watering, which is important to think about. We have a few more interviews here that I'm going to be discussing. Um, and uh, the one of these last ones is Vizcaya. Uh, museum, House and Garden. This was actually the last one. Um, so this is a beautiful old historic uh, garden. Uh, they are uh, right next to uh, Bay, where they are uh, very vulnerable to damage. And so they, uh, let's see it. I'm getting a little static here. I'm going to try to see what's going on. Uh, Vizcaya discussed that uh, replanting with salt-tolerant plants was helpful. So uh, they had sat in salt water for uh, uh, days, almost a week at some point. Um, and so if you have plants that are going to be damaged by salt, then it is important to think about specimens uh, when you're replanting that may uh, not be as heavily affected by that flooding. So uh, again, we talked about the edge effect at Montgomery Botanical Garden. Uh, the mangroves, like I was talking about, act as a barrier from storm surge. And uh, so if you have uh, 
peripheral parts of your garden that you could plant with uh, hedges, forms, junipers, cedars, anything that would provide a barrier to your internal collection. That may be important in reducing some of that edge effect. Uh, so that's an interesting tip that they had talked about. Uh, and they had also recommended county services as a, uh, a, uh, a great resource for many organizations. So all the themes that were discussed uh, with individual gardens, I laid out in a, uh, a chart to see uh, who had talked about the same theme. Um, these are some of the major themes that were discussed. And it, uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the items that were discussed most were the volunteer help. Uh, you can see there's six. There we go. There's six uh, organizations that had talked about having volunteers assist in a large, uh, helpful capacity after an event. There uh, was six organizations that had discussed uh, dispersing plants and seeds off-site. So taking your germplasm and making sure that for your, uh, for your highest priority plants and collections, you're not the only garden or site that has those specimens. So if they're a historic tree from the founder of the site, the estate that you work for, you want to have propagules of that tree. You want to have vegetative cuttings of that tree living off the site in other regions so that if something happens to that tree, you could get that germplasm back from those outside organizations and replant to that historic uh, 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 community, um, where if you hadn't done that, then your germplasm would be lost. You'd never have that tree to replant. Um, so dispersing plants and seeds off-site. And then uh, just in terms of practicality, um, after disasters, uh, if you have a botanical collection, uh, you're going to need water to keep that uh, collection going after a disaster. And if you don't have a backup water source, then you're going to be in trouble. So having a backup water source was something that uh, six of the nine gardens had discussed as being very important. So. Uh, we have gone through the interviews. Uh, we've gone through case studies, and we've talked about surveys in terms of natural disaster damage to plant collections. Um, let's see if some of you have some specific plants that you would like to actually talk about at the end of the discussion here. Um, so if you do, here's the answer to that original question. It says that 16 of you do. If you have something uh, that you would like to talk about specifically, um, go ahead and in the general chat, type in a couple words about what that collection or plant is. And then we'll see at the end, after I've discussed revisions to the FEMA document and a, 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 a little case study, we'll see if we can get to some of those um, specific plants if you want to see uh, what the community would say about how you can prioritize or salvage those collections. Uh, so here we go. I am going to talk a little bit about the uh, revisions that were made to the FEMA document um, based on the case studies and the interviews that were made. Um, so let's get this little back over here. Uh, many of the organizations that I uh, interviewed and did the case studies, talked about having staff and volunteer contact lists, a preset and ready to go, equipment lists ready to go of what equipment you'd need to either uh, chainsaws or cranes, um, replanting strategies, what to focus on, what to prioritize, uh, and also creating help networks before a disaster happens. It's easier to touch base with people and have lunch and discuss how you can help one another before a disaster hits and being uh, hit by something and then having to ask uh, for help. 
um, everybody's going to need help at that point. So you want to try to make it as efficient as possible by knowing who you can count on before a disaster. So um, the original document uh, was changed quite a bit. You can see all the different colors that were changed due to case studies, interviews, general feedback, or information that I had learned through uh, going to different conferences. And this, this is less blurry, the last slide is a little blurry, I'm sorry. Um, but you can see the amount of information that was changed on that original FEMA document. So uh, we've talked about the template. We have talked about specific information uh, that you ca I learned uh, from interview sites. Let's actually go through the uh, document itself and talk about how to build a plan. So uh, timing-wise, I'm going to take about 10 minutes to discuss this. And after I discuss this, uh, we will field some questions. So I actually am going to use my current organization, Children's Fairyland, as a uh, case study for a quick little uh, building of a template. So uh, the first thing that you want to do in developing a plan for your organization's uh, uh, disaster management plan is organizing resources. So at Children's Fairyland, uh, getting support for the project and building a team to work with and engaging employees is the first step. Uh, I, in red, you will see below, uh, all this red information is the general uh, information for Fairyland's emergency planning uh, team. Verbally, I'm going to be discussing what I would do for a plant collection. Uh, so you can see the difference between the red is uh, the written for the general information, and verbally I will be discussing what I would do for a plant collection plan. So getting support for the project, I would need to actually get my boss, the facilities manager, I'm the landscape supervisor, I would need to get my boss on board with protecting the collections. So getting support for the project is uh, getting my staff in line uh, with the general staff, um, creating a and distributing a staff contact list is a general uh, uh, piece of the equation uh, that would be included. Uh, creating a cleanup effort resource list would be different for a plant collection than it would be for the general uh, plan. So in the general plan, we're going to talk to our city which is the landlord. We're going to talk to a utilities locator, which would be helpful for electric and for uh, gas and for the sewer and water locations. Um, we're going to talk to local contractors. But in terms of creating a cleanup effort resource list, that's going to look different for a botanical collection. So I am going to talk to a local arborists that I have done work with before. I'm going to talk to lawn care specialists that I've had to utilize before uh, and create a resource list using them and not the general. Uh, uh, emergency responders and horticultural contacts, uh, list them out that we can call for help and aid after an event. We're lucky here in the Bay Area. We have a group of colleagues called the Bay Area Gardens Network. Uh, we have an informal email list that we, we all communicate uh, with one another through. and so. Uh, that would be a resource that would be very valuable after uh, disaster events occurred to get information from. Um, there is also some extension help that we may be able to utilize through the University of California's extension system. And having those horticultural contacts in place would be very important to children's fairyland oak trees in particular. So after we've looked at organizing some resources, we are going to develop a plan. So in order to develop that plan, you need to assess your risk. So at Children's Fairyland, the general risks that we could incur include earthquakes, high winds, fires, drought, and urban disturbance. 
In terms of our plant collections, our trees would be hit the worst by high winds, fires, uh, drought, and potentially urban disturbance. Uh, included is also freezes in our horticultural hazards. That would not be generally a problem in our uh, general facilities hazards because freezes can damage the plants. Uh, freezes generally, our buildings are strong enough to withstand a heavy frost. So that is a good thing for children to carry home. Um, we would want to talk to our longtime staff members about what hazards had happened in the past to see if what I was uh, thinking had been in line with the historical reality of the site. Uh, just because I've been there seven years doesn't mean that uh, a hazard hasn't happened 22 years ago that I wouldn't know about. So talking with your long-term uh, employees and uh, board members or uh, volunteers is very important. So evaluating your collections and plants for high value. At Children's Fairyland, I am the same as Longview House and Gardens. My canopy is most important. So my oak trees are what is providing shade for visitors. They are what is shading the collections underneath. We have a, a nice camellia collection. We have some rhododendrons, some azaleas. And if those oak trees were gone, I would be in trouble. So I'm going to prioritize my salvage based on those oak trees because without the oak trees, the rest of my garden is going to suffer. Um, so assessing monetary replacement value for, for these trees before a disaster would be important. I could talk to my city tree department. I could talk to those arborists that I had used uh, for uh, general cleanup services before to try to assess the replacement value for these trees. And um, I could assess the historical or social significance of these trees uh, with my community. Uh, I could also ask my community if there are other items that I'm missing uh, besides the oak trees. What is important to the visitors of Children's Fairyland and why? So the third phase in developing a plan is mitigation planning. So deciding what plants to focus on, and then seeing what it would take to keep those plants safe. So deciding what plants to focus on, we were just talking about uh, potentially uh, talking with uh, stakeholders about what they think is important besides just me, because although I'd love for my word to be the last, it is not. So it's important to see what those stakeholders also think is important. Uh, Within those collections of important plants, what are you going to focus on most during the disaster? So again, for me, it's the oak trees. But for, uh, for somebody else, let's say there's the Luther Burbank estate up in the North Bay. So Luther Burbank was a um, plantsman who developed many, many, many cultivars uh, of plants that became uh, commercially and agriculturally important. So he has a Santa Rosa plum up there and some potatoes that he developed that are extremely important. And so for his collection and interpreting his importance to the uh, plant world, those plants would be the most important at that uh, estate. So uh, deciding what plants or items to focus on, uh, you want to uh, know what to prioritize by making those decisions. In terms of keeping those highest priority plants or collection items safe, uh, you want to actually specifically look at what those plants are and how to keep them safe. So for my oak trees, let's say, um, uh, I want to try to encourage healthy roots so that they are strong specimens that can rebound after an event. I want to uh, eliminate as many of the pest problems that I can that are sapping energy from the trees before an event so that they're healthy and can rebound quicker after. Again, uh, as with the other sites that we talked about in the interview theme that needed water after a disaster, I want to make sure that I'm going to have access to some water to be able to uh, get them uh, some uh, 
from H2O if they need it after a huge um, event in order to keep them happy. Uh, and when it comes to actual mitigation planning, you're going to need a team to come in and help after the disaster. So uh, deciding who is going to implement the plan, who's going to be there to safeguard um, the collection, and again, make sure that the chainsaw action that is happening during the salvage and cleanup is appropriate and not excessive. Uh, the scenarios would be different for different disasters. So if my oak trees uh, uh, experienced a fire, that would be very different than if my oak trees experienced a unfortunate riot. So that's not a natural disaster, but that is one of the threats that we have um, in an urban setting, is having people jump the fence and uh, create damage. So what is the uh, responsibility going to be for the staff in those different scenarios? Are we going to hire security? Are we going to uh, set the sprinklers on in a fire and run the sprinklers so that the area is wet beforehand so it would have potentially less um, damage due to the moisture and humidity in the air than it would have if it was dry tinder to light up? So think about the different scenarios, the different hazards, and what the actual response would have to be for those different disasters. You want to talk about who the first person is going to be back on scene. Uh, if I'm the landscape supervisor and I cannot be on scene, how is the next person going to know down the list uh, what to focus on? We need to have an initial recovery person or group uh, ready so that um, you can document damage, assess the safety, and start uh, mitigation practices. And it needs to be communicated with multiple people and be stored in uh, not only at the gardens but off-site so that if uh, one person can't access um, the recovery plan, another person will be able to. And in that plan, you want to have who is going to be able to contact the, uh, the emergency response team and potential security or police forces. So we're almost there. We have talked about a plan. We've uh, talked about how to salvage specific plants. We are going to implement the plan and monitor its progress. So you want to uh, write the plan up and keep it in a safe place. You want to make sure that, again, it's on-site and off-site, uh, so on your uh, server, on a network server, so that multiple people have access to it. Uh, we're going to talk with organizations both in and out of the area, so regional uh, and out of the region organizations to help uh, re with recovery. Uh, organizations that are in the area are also going to be hit by the potential natural disaster. So you want uh, folks that are out of the area to be partners to be able to come back and help you. Uh, if they're safe, then they can come in and um, help you with your cleanup and salvage. And again, contacting local university extension offices, county agencies, uh, they may already have some research and planning materials for you to be able to utilize. So updates. Once you have a plan, you want to make sure that it's updated uh, annually. Uh, Staff and plants change, so you want to make sure that both are changes are accounted for. Uh, you want to have a review uh, annually. So do that the same week every year so it becomes routine. And here in California, in October, we have the Great Shakeout. And it's an opportunity for schools and community organizations to all do an earthquake drill on the same day. Uh, so it becomes routine. Uh, people know that it's going to come. They're not surprised by it. And they uh, get into uh, the practice of uh, dealing with an issue so that it, it uh, isn't a surprise if and when it does happen. Um, you want to uh, build those partnerships during that week so that you have them and they're ready to go before a plan happens. So you can test uh, your plan. You can evaluate its effectiveness uh, after a disaster. And um, that's important because uh, you can lessons learned. If you actually 
unfortunately have to deal with a disaster, you'll be able to know whether or not the plan that you had originally created is going to work. So uh, go ahead and evaluate the effectiveness of the plan and make sure that is written up in a new plan that would either uh, be the same or be even better than your original plan. And uh, lastly here, you want to communicate the plan that you've created to new staff members. So what good is an annual update and an annual walkthrough if half the staff uh, uh, is added in midway through the year and doesn't know anything about the plan? Uh, new staff members definitely need to be updated uh, during new hire training on uh, what is going on uh, with the plan and the processes for um, uh, or um, dealing with a disaster. So we have talked about finding general resources here. We've talked about um, some specific plant-based information gleaned during surveys, case studies, and interviews. We've talked about revisions to a FEMA document 3866 on uh, developing a more plant collections-based uh, template. And uh, we've talked about a, a case study using my organization, Children's Fairyland, as a model. Uh, I want to remind you about general planning resources that I have on the first slide. Here are some actual physical links that you can use. These are also in the handouts that you can download down below. Uh, so no need to fret about writing anything down. It's already in the handouts. These are garden-specific resources. So American Public Gardens Association has a wonderful disaster response center that they've created to uh, help one another uh, before and after uh, disasters. Uh, that's the last bullet point here down on the bottom. Uh, please go to that if you have a botanical collection that you're interested in safeguarding. It is a very uh, wonderful resource for you to be able to use. Um, there is a library and media center within the APGA's website. If you type in uh, disaster or disaster planning in that search box, you'll get all kinds of wonderful resources. Uh, my thesis is actually, the full thesis is actually uh, in that uh, media center, so you can have access to the uh, more in-depth information in that thesis. And as I was mentioning, in 2009, the American Public Gardens Association actually added um, a disaster planning uh, requirement for uh, addition of an accredited uh, plant collection to be uh, considered a part of their network. So if you are interested in learning about how to comply with the uh, new standards, please look up the middle link there for the American Public Gardens Association uh, Plant Collections Management. Uh, program. And I believe we're getting close to the end here. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, presentation that was given at the American Public Gardens uh, National Conference uh, last year in 2018 in Anaheim. If you are interested in some more specific information about botanical collections and their uh, 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 planning for uh, damage to your collections, please look this, uh, this presentation up. It is a great resource for you. Uh, it's called Thriving in Disaster, and you can see it in that uh, library and media center in the American Public Gardens Association. So we have a, uh, just a couple minutes for questions. Uh, here's some disasters at Children's Fairyland. Here's a squirrel eating this Muppet's bonnet. Uh, and some flooding that happened at the base of the uh, Wonder Go Round, the Allison Wonder Go Round. Uh, so I have one question here about bromeliads and orchids uh, established in trees in the garden. How to safeguard, I'm assuming, bromeliads and orchids that are established in trees in the garden. Uh, so if it was me, uh, long story short, I would make sure that that those orchids and bromeliads were actually pulled out of those trees before a hurricane was going to come through. If you don't, those bromeliads and orchids will be in the neighboring garden after the event. 
So uh, if that is not an option, I would see us taking uh, propagules of those, of vegetative cuttings. Uh, bromeliads you can uh, divide. So you might be able to divide those bromeliads and get separate uh, propagules to have in a safer environment during a disaster. Uh, orchids may or may not have vegetative uh, cuttings or propagules that you would be able to divide and take. Um, so those orchids would be uh, uh, something that you may want to take down out of those trees before the garden. Sometimes you can have uh, put them in pots and then uh, uh, attach the pots to the tree so it would be removable. Uh, if it was a very important uh, item, then that might be something that you could do. Otherwise, having a replacement strategy, so uh, uh, bromeliad and orchid, tropical fern grower that's outside of your region, having a contract with them before, uh, just a standing contract to say if there's a disaster, I'm going to be the first person that you're going to sell to to replace my bromeliads and orchids. Um, if that would be allowed in your budget, that may be something that would be important to have a replacement strategy for those bromeliads and orchids. Um, does any other botanical person that's here in the talk have any other ideas that uh, she could use for her bromeliads and orchids that are established in the trees? If so, please add in the general chat. Otherwise, it I says, think that thank is you. all the time yeah, that we um, have. Please fill in the course evaluation. I'm going to add a few things to the handout before I post it. Um, so I will post the recording, the PowerPoint slides, the handout, the planning te uh, um, template, and I will post those. As soon as you no longer see the ad for this webinar on our website, you'll know that all of that is in the um, archives for 2019. And join us next month for old loans. In May, we're going to do something on care of herbaria, which may be of interest to many of you. And um, I'm also going to post, we did a, a webinar a few years ago on uh, living animal collections that might be related to several things that Jackie said today. So um, we'll see you next month. Remember that we have the reorg course coming up if you're interested in that. And um, all of our webinars are available free to listen to. Courses cost something, but um, the webinars